Hi, everyone. Um, there's seats down the front here if you'd like to take some. There's seats down the front. Okay. All right. So uh, let's make a start. Um, uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to the uh, symposium on HIV transmission, virus, host, and microbiome. I'm Gilda Tastrom from the Burnett Institute in, in Melbourne, Australia, and my co-chair is Alexandra Tricola from the University of Zurich in Switzerland. In this session, we are going to examine the very early events in HIV transmission to identify opportunities to fight the virus, recruit the host, and manipulate the environment to fight in the fight to end HIV transmission. So before I introduce our first speaker, um, I've been asked by the organisers to give um, a setting the scene presentation, so I'll start with that. And uh, I have no disclosures. So um, globally, there was almost 2 million new HIV infections in 2017. And while there was a 16% decline um, since 2010 among adults, there still remains a high burden of um, new HIV infections in sub-Saharan Africa, representing 65% of global infections. And every week, 7,000 adolescent girls and young women become infected with HIV. So given that the early events in transmission sets the course of HIV infection, there's a need to understand this process to inform antiviral prevention, vaccine and cure strategies. The majority of HIV infections are sexually transmitted by the, rec the genital and rectal mucosa, where the virus can um, establish infection by entry through the vagina, ectocervix and endocervix of the female genital tract, the inner foreskin of the male genital tract and the rectal um, mucosa of the intestinal tract. Now you can see here that the risk of transmission per exposure varies uh, within mucosa, distinct mucosal tissue and uh, between different mucosal tissues. And uh, this variability um, can be due to uh, virus host, um, viral and environmental factors. So if we consider the female um, genital tract uh, we know that there is a formidable barrier uh, for HIV transmission. And those barriers include the physical barriers, such as mucus, that uh, sits on top of the endocervix and uh, traps viral particles, preventing these virions uh, to traverse this single layer of columnar epithelium to infect target cells in the submucosa. And to some extent, the uh, more substantial stratified epithelium of the ectocervix and vagina although we know that um, the virus can actually penetrate through the epithelium in the absence and presence of abrasions. There's also the innate and adaptive immunity, including soluble factors as well as immune cells that include these epithelial cells that respond to pathogen-associated molecular patterns to elicit the production of immune mediators that have antiviral and pro-inflammatory properties that are important for clearing infections, but paradoxically, they promote HIV infection in women. And of course, the, the mucosal surface is not sterile. It is colonised with the microbiota, which are communities of bacteria along with fungi and viruses. And these bacterial communities can um, compete with pathogens and they produce antimicrobial factors that include bactericins in addition to organic acid metabolites, such as lactic acid uh, that is produced by vaginal lactobacilli associated with HIV protection. So um, sometimes that formidable barrier breaks down, and which is the case in young women in South Africa, where these women tend to be colonised with highly diverse vaginal microbiota exemplified by bacterial vaginoses. And uh, the bacterial vaginoses, there is a depletion of the uh, beneficial lactobacilli. And so in this instance, there's an increased risk of HIV in these women in addition to an increased risk of other sexually transmitted infections. And both bacterial vaginosis and STIs can uh, result in general inflammation that increases HIV risk. So if we consider women who have lactobacillus dominated microbiota, we have uh, low acidity in the vagina that is antimicrobial, and we have this relatively non-inflammatory environment where there's a reduced risk of HIV acquisition and where pre topical pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, has maximal efficacy. 
In contrast, with where we have women who have highly diverse microbiota, such as bacterial vaginoses, the pH goes up, and we have this pro-inflammatory milieu, which um, results in the recruitment of activated uh, CD4 positive T cells that act as fuels for HIV infection, in addition to um, a decrease in barrier integrity. And in this scenario, um, there's, the woman is more likely to be infected with HIV, and uh, the efficacy of topical PrEP could be undermined, particularly as well when we know that um, these BV bacteria can also metabolise tenofovir, which is in oral um, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So if we consider it, this environment, can we manipulate it with um, antibiotics and or probiotics, shifting it from this highly diverse microbiota to this um, lactobacillus-dominated microbiota, which is associated with uh, protection against HIV? So during HIV transmission of the mucosa, systemic infection is usually established by a single genetic variant from the donor called the transmitted founder. And this um, exquisite bottleneck is due to statistic, uh, sorry, st stochastic and selective forces. And an example of selective forces um, is evidenced by a bias for selection of more fit consensus variants, although this bias is reduced by general inflammation. We also know that there's strong evolutionary pressure on HIV in vivo by HLA-restricted immune responses, and the question is whether um, that uh, pressure is also um, exerted on transmitted founder viruses. So what we're going to be addressing in this session is what are the implications of the transmitted virus that wins on virus evolution, clinical outcomes, and vaccine design? And so um, the, what happens very early in HIV transmission also has uh, relevance for HIV cure strategies. So recent um, data has shown that suppressive HIV treatment of acute infection in FIBIG1 can result in viral rebound after art interruption. And this indicates that the reservoir is seeded very early in infection, and this is consistent with earlier um, studies from SRV-infected macaques showing that the reservoir can actually be seeded during the eclipse phase when you don't have any detectable viral RNA. We also know that the HIV DNA reservoir is genetically stable on suppressive art, at least in the periphery. So taken together, this suggests that the latent reservoir should represent the early genetic archive and any subsequent within-host evolution. So the question is, what are the implications of the genetic archive for kicking hill strategies to purge the HIV reservoir? So with that, um, I'll stop there, and um, it's now my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this session, um, who is Jonathan Carlson, who's the Director of Immunology for Microsoft Healthcare um, in Seattle. And the title of uh, Jonathan's presentation is Why the Transmitted Virus Wins. Okay, Jonathan, right behind me. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Gilda, for that, uh, that beautiful introduction, uh, for really setting the stage. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak today and for uh, proposing this, uh, this uh, rather interesting title. So a quick back of the envelope calculation suggests that the average chronically infected individual harbors upwards of a quarter billion virions inside of them. Yet, as Gilda pointed out, when transmission occurs, it is typically established by a single genetic variant. So what I'd like to talk about today is What's so special about that founder virus? What I'd like to do for the next 15 or 20 minutes or so is sort of look over the last decade or so of research in this space and try and cast it in the context of a very simple model that will help us reason about what's going on at the site of transmission. Now, before we can address this question, we first have to ask a more basic question, which is, should we even be surprised that there's only a single founder virus? Nine years ago, uh, Abrahams et al. pointed out that, according to some simple models, there's actually far too many infection events that are established by multiple variants. And I'd like to dig into this a little bit deeper with a slightly different model. When we think about transmission, I think the right way to think about this is in the context of a single exposure. What we want to do is think about what's the probability that one, two, three, or even zero variants are transmitted. And when we think about that, we need to make a couple assumptions. Uh, uh, there's two very simple assumptions we can make up front. One is that all of these variants in the donor are equally likely to establish infection. And the other is that all these variants are acting independently of each other. And if that's the case, then the number of transmitted variants will follow binomial distribution. And you don't need to know anything about the binomial, except that it's parameterized by essentially the viral load in the donor and essentially the per variant probability of establishing infection. 
Now, if we're going to fit this model to any sort of data, the most important data point we need to remember is what Gilda uh, pointed out, which is roughly 99% of all exposures result in no in, uh, transmission at all, which is to say that 99% of the probability mass must sit on zero transmitted variance. Now, if we fit a model that way and then focus in on what happens when transmission does occur, what we'll find is that, according to this model, 99.5% of all transmission events must be established by a single virus. As Gilda pointed out, typically uh, it's, this number is closer to 80%. And in fact, uh, if you do perform deep sequencing, some authors have pointed out that this number is probably even lower than that. So the question is, why are so many of these uh, infections established by more than a single variant? This is just sort of trying to, to turn the question on its head a little bit. That one of the key implicit assumptions of the model I just presented was the assumption that all exposures are equally likely to result in transmission, which is clearly an incorrect assumption. If we relax this model just a little bit and allow there to be a mixture of, of uh, exposure risks and really allow that to vary over two to three orders of magnitude, then we can get a distribution that roughly matches what we see in nature. This isn't a perfect match, but again, my point here is not to develop a perfect model, but to just show that a very simple model can come close to capturing uh, what we observe in nature. Now, we'll use this model moving forward, but one of the important uh, predictions this model makes is the perhaps obvious uh, intuition that multiple founder viruses will be almost exclusively found among individuals or among exposures that were very high risk. So in this particular simulation, the average risk among exposures that resulted in multiple variant infections was roughly 52.5% which is basically a 2x uh, relative hazard compared to exposures that resulted in a single, vari a single variant transmission and a 5,000x relative uh, hazard compared to exposures that did not result in infection. So what happens when we actually go and look at the data? Again, the, the, key, the key prediction here is that if you have higher risk, you're more likely to be infected by more founder viruses, which is, uh, I think, a fairly intuitive statement. Well, as Gilda pointed out, one of, the, one of the, the strongest predictors of transmission is the source partner's viral load. And indeed, at least in the macaque model, there's pretty good evidence that increasing the viral inoculum will increase the probability of transmission by multiple founder viruses. Similarly, ge genital inflammation both increases the risk of infection and increases the frequency with which multiple founder viruses are observed. And similar observations have been made based off the route of infection. Although it is important to point out that these uh, trends tend to be very small, and there's plenty of examples in the literature where these predictions do not hold up, which may suggest that the, our model is overly simplified. And perhaps the most obvious uh, uh, simplification that we've made is that all the variants are acting independently of each other. One of the more intriguing papers in my mind of the last decade in this, uh, in this area was by Lee et al. in 2009 that, that showed in the macaque model that infection in the, in the uh, female genital tract actually causes the signaling cascade that recruits in activated CD4 target cells, which would presumably uh, facilitate the infection of additional founder viruses. Nevertheless, as the old saying in the modeling community goes, all models are wrong, but some are useful, at least in some situations. So we will press on. Uh, one of the uh, key questions is, of course, does this matter at all clinically? I think one of the key uh, papers on this was done by Holly Janes and uh, Morgan Rowland et al. a few years ago, looking at the vaccine trials of STEP and RV144. In both of these trials, the authors observed roughly a third of a log increase in viral load among individuals who were infected by more than one founder virus. Now, the mechanisms for this are not clearly understood, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that it's related to the increased evolutionary potential that a diverse uh, founder population will have. All right, so we shouldn't be surprised that there's a single founder, single founder virus, but I think it's still appropriate to ask the question if there's anything special about that one founder virus when it does break through an established infection. And I think maybe a better way to think about this is are there evolutionary pressures that are uh, uh, present at the site of infection? So one way to look at this is to simplify or simple model even further. So if we think about our source partner as being infected with only two variants, call them red and blue, now we can say given that infection occurred, what are the odds that the founder virus is red? Now, taking our simple model and adding in some uh, elementary uh, approximations, we end up with a very, very simple expression, which is that the log odds that the founder virus is red is approximately equal to the log of the relative frequency of the red virus in the source partner, plus the log of the relative fitness of the red virus in the context of transmission. So how can we actually look at this in data? A few years ago, working with Eric Hunter and Todd Allen, uh, we performed deep sequencing on five source partners to get a relatively precise estimate of the amino acid frequency at every site in the donor quasi-species. 
that's shown here on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis here, we plotted the average probability that those amino acids would be transmitted or would be found in the, fi in the founder virus of the recipient. And we saw essentially a one-to-one -one map uh, with some noise between the frequency of the amino acid in the donor and the probability that it would be transmitted, basically capturing the first part of this uh, approximation. Now, we only observed this when we looked at amino acids that were consensus sequences in the local population, in this case in Zambia. When we looked at amino acids that differed from the local uh, consensus, we saw this entire curve shift down, which is consistent with the idea that these red viruses are, on average, less fit. And again, making this log term negative and pulling this entire curve down. So the upshot is that consensus variants are typically favored in the context of transmission, an observation that has been made in multiple cohorts with pretty different statistical methods. We can also look at this in terms of experimental uh, assays, and this has been done by a number of groups. For example, it's, it's been shown that founder viruses tend to be more sensitive to antibody neutralization, tend to be more CCR5 tropic and favor uh, CD4 cells that have high CD4 concentrations, tend to have higher infectivity and OM comp content and higher in vitro replication capacity, rates of particle release, and type 1 interferon resistance. Although, again, it is important to point that many of these observations have not been replicated in all cohorts, suggesting that there is a strong interaction in the context of different uh, biological scenarios. Taken together, though, the founder viruses, I think we can, we can conclude, uh, may be more likely to infect the first cell and more likely to sustain propagation to subsequent cells. Now, these may be pretty obvious statements, but the second one is actually kind of intriguing and has some interesting implications. Uh, specifically, it suggests that there's an opportunity to block systemic spread, which is to say it's not a foregone conclusion that you'll get systemic infection once the first uh, target cell has been infected. And again, I'd point back to an exemplary example of this Leodol paper that showed that if you block the signaling cascade, you can actually uh, delay onset of systemic infection and possibly even block it. And I'd argue that the astounding success of PrEP and, and the rather intriguing success of the CMV T cell vaccines of the macaque model also point toward this uh, conclusion as well. There's another interesting prediction that this makes, which is that there will, be high, there will be local mucosal infections that are not observed systemically. And perhaps the most interesting uh, study to date on this that I'm aware of comes from Katja Klein and Eric Arts, who just published a few months ago, a study uh, looking at uh, a number of acutely affected women. And what they found was a much higher genetic diversity among viruses uh, isolated from the cervical, plasma, uh, cervical mucosa compared to viruses isolated from plasma. In fact, if you try to, to turn that into an estimate of the number of founder viruses, you get the typical roughly 65 or 70 percent uh, founder viruses estimated from the plasma, but every single one of the women had at least three founder viruses in the cervix, again consistent with this idea that some of these virions are not able to move on and establish systemic infection. So there appears to be evolutionary pressure favoring some genetic variants of the virus. I think the next important question is, is this changed by infection risk? Again, we can turn back to our simple model and ask, what would we expect to see? And I would posit that in many cases, infection risks, specifically biological risk, can be modeled as a constant increase in the fitness of every virion. That is to say, it's as if we took every single virus and simply added a constant to the probability that it would be able to establish infection. Now, if you accept this, hopefully it'll be obvious that if you add a constant to both the numerator and denominator of a fraction, that fraction will move closer to one, which is to say this log term will vanish. Put another way, there's less selection pressure in the context of high-risk exposure. So is there actually evidence for this? Well, one way that we've looked at this is, again, going back to this observation that transmitted founder viruses tend to be closer to consensus. And one way to look at that is to look at the probability that each amino acid in a virion that's found in the donor will be transmitted to the recipient as a function of how common that amino acid is in the circulating population. So in this case, we found, again, in Zambia, that amino acids that were very common in Zambia were almost always transmitted, whereas amino acids that were very rare in Zambia were much less frequently transmitted, even when they dominated the donor quasi-species. Now, this particular curve I'm showing is from female to male transmission. As Gilda showed, male to female transmission uh, bears higher risk per exposure, and as expected, we see less selection pressure here uh, being shown as a higher propensity for these rare amino acids to be transmitted. And similarly, in the context of female to male uh, transmission, when the male has genital ulcer or inflammation, again, increasing his risk of infection and thus also decreasing the selection pressure. So the upshot is that the founder viruses are closer to consensus, but especially when the biological risk of infection is low. This has been observed in several other cohorts as well. Uh, for example, Damien Tolley and Todd Allen 
noted that the founder viruses isolated from uh, acutely affected heterosexual males was much closer to consensus compared to the founder viruses isolated from men who have sex with men, again, consistent with the, the observation that these individuals tend to be at lower risk of infection per exposure. Similarly, Nobun Ngandu and Carolyn Williamson uh, looked at the Caprice 002 microbicide trial and found that the founder viruses isolated from women in the tenofovir arm tended to be closer to consensus compared to those women infected in the placebo arm. Again, consistent with the idea that tenofovir was raising a barrier to infection, which simultaneously lowers the risk of infection but increases the selection pressure fa favoring these particular variants. Evidence for this effect is a little bit harder to find in the experimental data, and I think there's a lot of questions as to why that is. As far as I'm aware, the, the clearest example of this, again, comes from the Williamson group, where they showed that there's less selection favoring high infectivity viruses in the context of genital inflammation. So again, these women that did not have genital inflammation uh, had founder viruses that almost always had high uh, in vitro infectivity compared to the women that did have uh, genital inflammation. Importantly, and again, this is a counterexample to what the model would predict, this was not observed by the Williamson group within the Caprisa trial, and in fact, they found uh, the opposite uh, effect in which women, founder viruses from the tenofovir arm are actually had lower virulence. And I will say that the models don't have a good explanation for this, and uh, again, I just want to highlight that biology is always more complicated than models. So we use these models to guide our thinking, but not as a ground truth. In any case, I think one of the more, most important questions is, is there an impact on disease? And, and again, one of the more important observations comes from, the, the, from Carolyn Williamson's group that showed that there was a transient increase uh, in viral load among women infected on the tenofovir arm. Again, consistent with this idea that tenofovir was simultaneously lowering, lowering the risk of infection but increasing the odds that infection, the breakthrough infection would be on average by a more virulent strain. A similar study was recently presented at the HIV Dynamics and Evolution meeting by Sarah Stansfield and Josh Herbeck, uh, and is used by permission here. And what they did was they looked at the average viral load among men who have sex with men based off their self-reported role in the relationship. And what they found was roughly a third of a log higher viral load among men who self-reported as engaging exclusively in, in, in insert of intercourse compared to, to men that were either role versatile or exclusively receptive. Again, consistent with the observation that the exclusively insert of men have lower risk of infection. Now, there was an important caveat that they noted in this study, which I think is very interesting. And that is that they only observe this effect among longer duration partnerships. This is an effect that cannot be uh, predicted by the model I presented, but was perfectly predicted by their much more complicated network model. And I think there's more work that needs to be done to understand the, the implications of this. But essentially what I think is going on is that evolution has more of an opportunity to really exert its pressure in the context of repeated exposure by the same quasi-species. Again, this is, this is a recent observation. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really understand it. So in conclusion, a uh, single founder virus, we typically see a single founder virus in the context of transmission, but I, I do want to sort of turn this idea on the head and, and point out again and again that this is actually, 80% is actually a shockingly low number based off what we'd expect from, uh, from, from simple models. Second, multiple founder viruses are associated with higher viral load, which is something important to keep in mind. There is evidence of evolutionary pressure happening at the site of, of transmission with selection for variants that are closer to consensus with higher infectivity and type 1 interferon resistance and lower neutralizing antibody resistance, although, again, this is not observed in every cohort. One of the factors that appears to, to mitigate this effect, as predicted both by models and observed in data, is infection risk, in which increased infection risk increases the risk of being infected by multiple founders, decreases the selection pressure, and may be associated with lower viral load, though, of course, this is in tension with this other observation that... Uh, increased risk, increases the risk of infection by multiple founders. So I'd like to conclude with one final thought, which is what happens when we intervene with a vaccine or when something else changes in uh, the context of transmission? And the obvious conclusion should be that the fitness landscape will change. And the formal way to look at this in the context of vaccines is with sieve analysis, which is essentially asking the question, is the founder virus diverged between the vaccibo and placebo arms? And there's many, vaccine and placebo arms. So there's many ways to do that, but I'll point you to Civ Sifter, which is a nice tool recently published by Andrew Fiore, Gartland et al., that will do these analyses. If we look at the last decade, there were two vaccine trials that showed a statistically significant effect of vaccine on the risk of acquisition. RV144, in which the vaccine was protective, and the step study, the rather disastrous step study, in which the individuals in the vaccine arm were actually more likely to get infected than those in the placebo arm. In both cases, what we saw was a very strong sieve effect, again, where the founder viruses were, were substantially different between the two arms of the study, again, indicating that these vaccines were altering the evolutionary uh, landscape at the site of transition. 
And I'll close by pointing out a really interesting observation by Morgan Rowland and Paul Edlifson, which is that this sieve effect would be directly translated into vaccine efficacy that differs based off the challenge virus. In particular, the vaccine appeared to be roughly 50% effective against the so-called K169 variant, yet was not at all effective against this 169X mutation. Unfortunately, this 169X uh, variant has no known fitness uh, uh, impact on the virus, and thus we shouldn't be surprised by the uh, recently published uh, modeling results from Josh Herbeck at all, that we can expect the, the vaccine efficacy to wane pretty quickly over time should we roll out this vaccine because of these evolutionary impacts. So with that, I'll add one more conclusion, which is that vaccines will reshape the fitness landscape and end by thanking all the uh, people living with HIV who have uh, made all these research projects possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for a wonderful presentation. Um, are there any questions for Jonathan? He's just moved off. If not, a question? Yeah. We've got one question. Oh, we've got, uh, Gully? So, Jonathan, you, you speculate that um, there's um, killing of viral foci within tissues. So can you explain if that is true, if that fits in the model, why don't we see more immunity accruing high levels of immunity in people who are exposed more, effect, more often, um, and can you model in the number of exposures it requires um, in people who are exposed more to actually get transmission or to change the, the number of transmitted founders? Yeah, no, I think that's a hugely interesting question, and specifically if you're talking about adaptive immunity, because then you have a question of how much exposure is required to actually induce adaptive immunity. Uh, I don't think there's great evidence for that. There, there's uh, a couple of trials that have, or a couple of observational cohorts among high-risk individuals that suggest a protective effect. Um, I'd say there's a lot of work ongoing, and this will be really important to look at from the vaccine standpoint as well. But I don't have a good answer for that at this point. Yeah. So yeah. you're saying that <clears throat> the transmitted virus is a virus that uh, is more fit. It's closer to the consensus, so it has less evolved. It has been subjected to less pressure from the immune system, from the host, from the donor's uh, immune system. So, so why, why do you think that virus doesn't evolve? Is it in some place where it's not subjected to immune pressure? Um, is, and is there any data suggesting that or showing that um, virus from primary infection from one person evolves with time, is replaced by multiple strains, multiple variants, bearing a variety of different mutations, but that this initial virus is the one that's being that will be transmitted to a further host. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I do want to point out that if you go back to the, the simple equation that I put up, the most important thing is what's the frequency of the variant, right? The virus has to be in the right place at the right time or it's not going to transmit, right? And so I think it's important to remember that whatever evolutionary pressure that's happening there may be a very minor, maybe playing a very minor role compared to simply the probability that a virus is in the right place at the right time. So that's an important caveat. And, and I think one of the interesting questions is how strong is this evolutionary pressure? We see the effect genetically, but is it, is it a really strong impact clinically? Um, in, in terms of an, an archival, this archival hypothesis, which is the idea that the original infected virus has been archived away and is now reemerging in the context of transmission, it's a hypothesis that's been around for a while, and some of the data, some of these data that suggest a, a selection back toward consensus were interpreted in that light. I'm not sure that you can really, that you can really conclude that from the data that I've seen thus far. I, I, I think it's an open question. I, I would suggest that, in my personal view, I, I don't think that's terribly likely, just because of the odds of those viruses being in the right place at the right time. And you, you suggested, uh, my last question, you suggested last the possibility one. that some infections could be abortive because either the risk is very high or uh, the virus and or the virus that is transmitted is not very good. Yep. Uh, do we have any evidence for this? Yeah, so this, uh, so I, I, I sort of glossed over the evidence for that a little bit. This, this is a hypothesis that I, I believe is due to Ron Swanstrom originally. Um, the idea for this is that, that we see this, these effects of genetic selection when we look outside of envelope. And it's hard to imagine how GAG or, or Poll or NEF will be playing a, a role uh, except for after the initial infection of a target cell. And so if you're getting an evolutionary pressure on that, it probably has to do with the process by which the virus goes on to infect the next uh, 
the next round. You need a good gag as much as you need a good arm. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. yes. All right. So let's let's, let's, <laughs> let's take oh, one Sorry? more. Yeah. No, one there more. are more seats in the front. Please move up here to the thank front. You. Okay. So um, let's thank Jonathan for his presentation. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, good afternoon. So I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to present our work. I've ch slightly changed my title to early virologic and immunologic uh, events following untreated or treated acute HIV infection. So those are my disclosures. Um, so we've been interested in uh, understanding, gaining a better understanding of acute HIV infection um, uh, for various reasons, uh, but in general, we have been interested in particularly identifying individuals with the FIB1 or FIB2 acute HIV infection. And uh, by FIB1 and FIB2, we define it as uh, individuals that are on an, a viral load uh, upward trajectory and have no detectable humor immune responses. Whereas uh, individuals that have already reached peak viremia after acute HIV infection and have developed some uh, humor immune responses, we define those as being in FIB. Uh, stage three, uh, they are already past peak viremia. And the key questions that we're interested in understanding are what are the characteristics of the transmitted founder virus. We are also interested in characterizing the early immune responses uh, in acute HIV infection. Uh, and also uh, in the context of treatment, we are also interested in understanding what is the impact of uh, early antiretroviral treatment on anti-HIV immune responses. And ultimately, the questions that we would like to address is whether we can, uh, by understanding the nature of the transmitted founder virus or the nature of the early immune responses, whether we can either augment these immune responses uh, in order to make them better for vaccine uh, or cure uh, strategies. So uh, in order to do this, we developed a cohort where we could identify individuals with acute HIV infection, particularly during FIBIC stages one and two, and we call it the fresh cohort. Uh, FRESH stands for Females Rising Through Education, Support, and Health. In this cohort, we recruit women that are between the ages of 18 and 23 that are at high risk for HIV infection in KwaZulu-Natal. And we provide an intensive empowerment curriculum <clears throat> where the women come to the clinic uh, twice a week. And when they come to the clinic twice a week, we do a finger prick blood draw and we take the sample for uh, RNA testing. We have the result the following day. And if somebody is uh, infected with HIV, then we can st uh, start uh, treatment immediately. Now, we are also able to get uh, blood, female genital tract samples, as well as lymph nodes in some of these participants. And like I said, we are interested in, in studying both the host and viral factors associated with acquisition of disease, as well as disease progression. Unfortunately, despite our interventions in this cohort, we have had uh, 41 acute infections so far. Out of a, about uh, 16, more than 1,600 women that we enrolled, the incidence rate in this cohort is 8.3 per 100 person years. The first 14 individuals we identified with acute in infection were not treated because we were following the South African guidelines at the time, which called for initiation of treatment when somebody had CD4 count of 300, uh, 350 or less. About 70% of the individuals we have identified were in FIBIC stage one. Uh, most of them are within the median of four, uh, four days since the last HIV RNA test. And in most of the individuals for whom we started treatment early, the treatment was started within one day of uh, detection of acute HIV infection. So some of this, this is published, so I'm going to rush through this. Uh, this is a viral load trajectory in individuals that uh, uh, are not treated. So you see that they have a high viral load set point, as you would expect, because they're not treated during acute HIV infection. But individuals that were either treated with the three, the triple drug regimen that is the standard of care in South Africa, or individuals that had an intensification during the first two months with the rotegravir, in addition to the three drug regimen, reach uh, or suppress viremia very, very quickly, and within uh, uh, either two to six weeks or thereabout, they are fully suppressed in terms of uh, <clears throat> viremia in uh, peripheral blood. We also found that, uh, as I said, uh, Initiation of other treatment blunts uh, peak viremia. You can see here that there's a, almost a three log uh, food uh, lower uh, log viremia in uh, individuals that started uh, treatment early. And it also preserves CD4 cell count such that the individuals that started treatment early have a higher needed CD4 count during the first uh, one month of in, uh, following uh, infection. <clears throat> 
We have also reported that individuals that start uh, treatment early do not seroconvert, and this is when we assess this by Western blot. So this data shows the first 14 individuals that did not get treatment, and you can see that all of them seroconverted within a few weeks of infection, whereas uh, the majority of individuals that started uh, treatment after acute, uh, during febic stage one uh, did not seroconvert. In fact, the few individuals that you see that are uh, Western blot positive over time, like this individual here, are individuals that we actually missed during uh, febic stage one and we only uh, discovered they were HIV infected when they were in febic stage uh, five and, and onwards. So we've been interested in characterizing CD8 T cell immune responses in this cohort. And uh, uh, what we find is that in most uh, of these individuals, even those that start treatment during febic stage one, you can easily detect CD8 T cell immune responses, particularly by tetramer staining. And most of these uh, immune responses can persist. So we have looked at these immune responses up to one year post-infection, and we find that most of these uh, immune responses uh, persist over time. So overall, almost all participants who started treatment in febic stage one developed uh, CTL, cytotoxic T cell immune responses, and this is uh, as assessed by tetramer staining, by interferon gamma early spot, as well as uh, proliferation of CD8 T cell immune responses. What we do find, however, is that uh, in individuals that started treatment early, they have a much lower magnitude or frequency of tetramer spe HIV uh, specific CD8 T cell immune responses compared to individuals that were not treated during acute HIV infection. However, despite the fact that their magnitude of responses is lower, we find that uh, most of the CD8 T cells are highly functional, and in fact, they produce much more interferon gamma compared to individuals that were not uh, treated during acute HIV infection. Now, we have also been int interested in characterizing the phenotype of the CD8 T cells, HIV-specific CD8 T cells, that, um, that are produced in these individuals. And uh, I have this illustration here to show the different uh, uh, CD8 T cell subsets that have been uh, described in the literature, naive CD8 T cells, effector memory, transitional memory, and uh, central memory uh, cells, as defined by uh, these markers here, which I will not uh, uh, identify. But it's been shown in HIV infection that HIV infection skews the T cell phenotype towards the suboptimal and effective transitional memory phenotype. And it has been argued in the literature by um, uh, many investigators, uh, including uh, Louis Speaker and others, that in order for an HIV vaccine to be effective, you need to actually induce an effector memory uh, phenotype so that these cells are primed and ready to attack the virus should the person come into contact with the virus. And it has been argued that this, uh, the lack of this effector memory T cells is one of the reasons that HIV um, people are unable to control HIV through uh, the national, uh, natural uh, immune mechanisms. So we were interested in assessing how uh, introduction of RA antiretroviral treatment during uh, FIBIC stages one and, and two shifts the phenotype of the HIV-specific CD8 T cell immune responses. And what we see is that in untreated HIV infection, most of the HIV-specific CD8 T cells are, in fact, the transitional memory uh, of the transitional uh, memory phenotype. Uh, which you see dominates CD8 T cell immune responses during chronic HIV infection. However, when you treat uh, these individuals during uh, uh, febic stage, stage one, you tend to shift the phenotype of the uh, HIV-specific uh, T cells from the transition memory to the, um, to the effector memory uh, phenotype that has been uh, shown to be much more effective in controlling HIV and has been argued to be uh, that is going to be probably necessary to induce for an effective HIV vaccine. So these are the overall data showing uh, once again that uh, when you start treatment during FIBIC uh, stage, stages one, uh, uh, particularly during uh, FIBIC stage one, that you shift the phenotype of the HIV-specific uh, CD8 T cells toward uh, a T effector memory phenotype, and in fact those uh, HIV-specific CD8 T cells in these individuals tend to look like the CMV-specific uh, CD8 T cells, suggesting that they could be of much superior uh, functional quality compared to uh, those of, from untreated individuals. We have also done some transcriptional profiling of these HIV-specific CD8 T cells, and as you would expect when you introduce treatment, you 
completely shift the transcriptional profile of the HIV-specific uh, CD8 uh, T cells. Uh, and some of the uh, molecules that, uh, for example, are upregulated by early introduction of uh, treatment are molecules such as BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic uh, marker that uh, preserves or seems to be to, uh, you know, to preserve these uh, CD8 T cells. And you have done also some uh, flow cytometry to confirm that indeed in uh, treated HIV infection, the HIV-specific CD8 T cells have an, an, an anti-apoptotic uh, uh, phenotype that includes upregulation up of BCL, BCL2. So the other, the other inter uh, thing that we have been interested in looking at in this cohort is the potential of broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, for a possible uh, cure strategy. So it's been shown in the field that several broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, can prevent sheave infection in macaques and suppress viremia in HIV-infected individuals. And broadly neutralizing antibodies can suppress rebound during ART uh, interruption in some cases. And therapy with uh, a broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody has also been shown to elicit host immune responses against HIV and SHIV that are novel, including CD, novel CD8 T cell immune responses. And it's also been shown that broadly neutralizing antibodies used in protection studies can clear HIV from, uh, from distocytes. So we were interested in understanding whether the broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, that are available in the field can also neutralize the transmitted founder viruses from this cohort and uh, as a way to sort of predict whether these uh, participants could uh, benefit from a potential cure strategy using broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. So highlighted in this figure are some of the broadly neutralizing antibodies that we had in our, in our hands, PGT-121, VRC-01, and B, uh, BNC-117. So all the ones that are highlighted here in blue are the ones that uh, we were able to test some of the uh, transmitted founder viruses uh, against. And here is the data of the, uh, showing the sensitivity of various transmitter founder viruses uh, to the broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. And basically the takeaway uh, home message from this slide is that no single broadly uh, neutralizing antibody is able to neutralize all the transmitter founder viruses in the, in the fresh cohort with great uh, potency. However, some of the uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies such as B PGT 151, PGT-121, PGD-1400, uh, PGD and CAP-256 show very good uh, coverage and good potency. And in fact, uh, when we do an algorithm that combines, tries to combine these uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, we get very good coverage that uh, moves coverage of a single monoclonal antibody from about 60 to 70 percent to more than 90 percent. Uh, in this particular cohort, uh, suggesting that uh, maybe a combination of broadly neutralizing antibodies could be used uh, as, a, as a possible cure strategy uh, in, this, in this particular cohort. So uh, finally, we have also been interested in looking at the reservoir in, this, in, in the cohort. And once again, I show you data here on peak viremia, showing that uh, when you treat individuals, um, you're able to blunt peak viremia compared to individuals that are untreated. However, interestingly, when you look at the proviral DNA in the same individuals at the same time that you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the RNA load, you actually find that uh, initiation of RNA treatment does not seem to blunt uh, peak viremia, suggesting, uh, sorry, does not seem to blunt uh, the, pr the proviral load or the reservoir as, as measured by proviral DNA load. You know, suggesting that uh, the reservoir in these individuals is being established very early and is reaching a, a high peak very early, even before we initiate uh, treatment, which could make uh, uh, strategies aimed at, aimed at cure and eliminating the reservoir uh, very difficult in these individuals. However, when you treat these individuals over time, as you'd expect, uh, with prolonged treatment, the reservoir, uh, as measured again by proviral DNA, does go down over time. Uh, uh, it never reaches undetectable levels, and some of these individuals, we have now followed them uh, for two and, and three years, we can still detect proviral DNA. And, and uh, a lot of these individuals are individuals, again, that have been completely undetectable when we look at uh, plasma viral load. Uh, this is a comparison with untreated patients in whom the reservoir measurements remain stable over the, the, the period of, uh, of follow-up, uh, over 24 months uh, in this particular case.
as I mentioned, we have also had some uh, link node exitions from some of the participants. And what is interesting is that uh, uh, in every, almost every single lymph node sample that we have uh, examined, we can detect HIV P24 antigen, and we can also detect uh, P, uh, HIV uh, P24 RNA within the tissues. So here is an example of an individual that has been on treatment. As you can see, right from when they were acutely infected, their viral, plasma viral load is undetectable, and we were able to get a, a lymph node excision almost two years after they got uh, infected. And as you can see, we can very easily identify P24 within the B cell follicles within the lymph node, and we can also detect, readily detect HIV RNA uh, by RNA scope uh, within the, the lymph node tissue uh, as well, suggesting that there is ongoing either residual virus in these individuals or some ongoing virus replication within the lymph node or at least some ongoing virus transcription because we can still detect some HIV RNA within the tissues. So in conclusion, we, we, we have shown that acute HIV uh, infections can offer uh, novel insights into the characteristics of the transmitted founder viruses, uh, immune responses, as well as reservoir establishment. Study participants initiated on combination of antiretroviral therapy during FIBIC stages one and two showed diminished magnitude of humoral and cytotoxic T cell immune responses, but some of these cytotoxic T cell immune responses may be more functional, although the jury actually is still out on that, and we need to really investigate uh, the durability as well as the location of these immune responses uh, and uh, do ex vivo uh, functional studies to analyze these immune responses. In the fresh cohort, the reservoir is established very early, and even in FIBIC stage one treated participants, the size during acute HIV infection is similar to untreated individuals, and there is also persistence in lymphoid tissues. Early initiation of antiretroviral therapy leads to a slow but steady decay of the reservoir, which may have implications for ease of cure. And we think that perhaps a combination of approach, approaches such as early treatment uh, may be combined with specific antiviral uh, immune agents such as broadly neutralizing antibodies that target sanctuary sites, including uh, uh, lymphoid tissues, uh, might be important uh, for harnessing this uh, patient's immune system in order for us to achieve a functional cure, since we can show clearly that there seems to be viral persistence in, in these sanctuary sites, even in patients that are treated during FIBIC stage one. And finally, I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators, uh, particularly Krista Dong and Amber Moodley, who are responsible for this cohort, uh, Zazan Love, who has generated all the immunological data that I've uh, shown you here today, uh, and other colleagues in the laboratory, as well as uh, Bruce Walker, Galit Alter, and Matthias Ak uh, uh, Richterfield, whom we collaborate with, and also thank our funders. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see there is already a first question. Yes. Uh, just a little note of caution when you assimilate uh, the amount of DNA with the reservoir. As you know, early on in the infection, when the infection is very active, you have a lot of unintegrated DNA. And that unintegrated, the, the kinetics of disappearance of that unintegrated DNA is uncertain. We don't know very much. But I guess that much of the loss of DNA that you see might be in part uh, due to loss of unintegrated DNA. And then the bona fide reservoir DNA is something that you need to measure by measuring, it's, it's a bit tricky measuring uh, integrated DNA using ALU PCR or stuff like that. But um, it's just, just, just a caution, to, not, not to overuse the, the word reservoir for, for DNA. I, I, would, uh, I would agree with that uh, comment. Uh, my only point that I wanted to make is that the amount of proviral DNA amount in these individuals during acute HIV infection is exactly the same whether the individuals were started during uh, FIBIC stage one or were not treated. And uh, obviously we need to look at the decay kinetics of, of that uh, proviral DNA in order to accurately measure, accurately measure what would represent the reservoir over a long period of time. So. Um, so uh, you showed very nicely when you treat during hyperacute infection that you um, basically can shift the, 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 the CD8 T cells to the effective memory where you want to be. 
And you also postulated that you uh, would be interested in testing um, the combination of this very early treatment with a, with a BNAP treatment. And I assume the assumption there is that then uh, the CD8 T cells will be so active that they help you to, um, to basically prevent a rebound or lower rebound for sustained periods, as, as has been shown in the shift model, that it's possible. Mm -hmm. So my question to this concept is it's obviously super intriguing and would be fantastic if, if you could translate this from the, from the animal situation to, to real life. But uh, what from the data that you know uh, that you have now that you need that you know that you need to have to treat so very early to get this preservation of the CDA T cells? What time for for a treatment interruption would you have uh, for the CDA T cells to remain active? Because the same process will start over again, and you will lose activity very rapidly with rising viral loads. So, is there a threshold viral load that you that you consider that you can take the CDA T cells or? Yeah, I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good question, and, uh, and I don't have, obviously, I don't have an answer to that question at the moment. But uh, our hypothesis is that because these individuals are making such good CD8 T cell immune responses that seem to be at least theoretically uh, functionally superior, that it might be easier to prime those immune responses, maybe with uh, some kind of vaccination strategy or with an intervention such as a broadly neutralizing antibodies and that the CD8 T cell immune responses that will result as a result of those interventions will be of higher quality and much more highly functional. Now, um, whether that is actually going to turn out to be the case, I don't know because I don't even know how durable these immune responses are. And I don't know whether if you subsequently interrupt treatment, as you suggest, that uh, the rebound of viremia could uh, again... Uh, skew this CD8 T cell towards the phenotypes that are, uh, you know, suboptimally yeah. functional. So th those are questions that we don't have an answer to at the moment, but we are continuing to follow these patients to see, to look at the durability and uh, the functional stability of these cells. And ultimately, we would also like to do some interventions in this cohort to see whether we can address some of those questions uh, directly. Okay. So very exciting. Um, no more questions. So with this, I would like to wrap up this uh, session. And as I was told, this wrapping up consists of thanking you all very much for your wonderful talks and the audience for being there and hopefully enjoying the session. Thank you.